Is it okay? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, first, I have to thank Brad for inviting me uh, to start with. Uh, over the summer when we were doing Panya with me, we, um, I always tried to get a uh, word in edgewise about all the things that have been accumulating in me as far as uh, world concerns are. So I'm glad uh, that he actually asked me to come and speak to you all. Um, what I will do afterwards, um, uh, we will um, kind of explore things more in a deep way, but now f for the next little while I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what I have researched in the last 25 years or so. Um, maybe we better start with the story. Um, if you think uh, um, to the times um, between uh, 1850 and 1900 and put yourself into that space and all the things that were happening in the world at that point, you would find uh, that there was the Boer War in South Africa and all the different things that have happened in the world at that point in time. And of course, it was always funded. You need to have money. And there were lots of uh, people who went into that profession and didn't always have the best intentions for the people at large in mind. So I would say that um, there was a, a concerted effort to get that under control. So by, and, and actually um, before that we should actually look at the 350 years that um, the, the UK had um, control over India. Most people don't know that it actually lasted uh, 350 years, that control, you know, to control the people for that long. So um, anyways, um, that was all then before 1900. By 1902, uh, there were people in the UK who really uh, thought in order for them to have control over the world, they would have to somehow, they couldn't do it through the government. They, you know, to, to control it that way um, wouldn't have been easy enough. They figured there had to be another way and uh, they, at that point, formed what is called the Pilgrim Society. And the Pilgrim Society um, was, con was actually probably about um, 50 people or so that um, had the same idea. And they um, talked about that amongst themselves. And um, they really... Um, took the next seven years to figure out how are we going to control the world? How do we, how does the UK um, have power over the whole world the, the, the way that they wanted to? Uh, the money itself wasn't enough. And uh, so what they did is uh, by 1909, they called um, journalists um, from 49 countries around the world, they called them to London, and they wined them and dined them for a week. And they said the best way to control the world would be if they um, could have the influence from the newspapers at that time, and later on, of course, radio and all the other media that we have uh, to make sure to control that. And that's been happening since 1909. And it only took, it took them, um, in other words, until 1913 uh, to have um, the um, Federal Reserve started in the United States. They made sure that they had propaganda 
In 1907, they had a meeting, the bankers had a meeting in Jack, on Jack and, Jekyll Island that was totally uh, secret. There was one um, um, statesman at that time who could see what that plan was all about, and he tried to um, uh, stop that, uh, but uh, they somehow got rid of him. And uh, so when they had that meeting at Jekyll Island, uh, they decided that, South Carolina. Yeah, Jekyll Island, North Carolina. And it was very secretive and so forth. So anyways, they, they, most, of, most of you might know about all that, but it took them only another four years uh, to 1913 to start the Federal Reserve, which of course is not federal and which is not a reserve. And ever since then, the United States has had income tax because uh, the Federal Reserve borrows money to the government in the U.S. and the, the U.S. has to pay um, interest to those people who get that money out of thin air. And um, so, uh, you know, we've had a taxation um, income tax uh, since that time. So then it only took another year after 1913, when they had all that in place, to start World War I under pretenses that certainly history doesn't pan out that there was a need for a war. But they had the propaganda of the newspapers at that time all the way, and so it wasn't hard for them to really um, um, publicize it in such a way that um, you, 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 know, you would believe what the newspaper says. And people did believe that. And of course, then they had World War I. And of course, after that, the Depression and all that kind of thing. I don't need to go into the history of all that. Because um, as you can see, underneath uh, what the um, journalists are doing is always the banking. So here we, whoever has the money will control the world. So anyways, um, so in 1914 they had World War I. Then um, after that um, you had, um, I mean, World War I and the world uh, that never actually stopped. They never had a peace treaty or anything like that. Uh, the idea was um, to weaken uh, the German people because uh, there was, um, you know, the uh, machinery and, and um, you know, things were built in such a way that they really would be um, right to the nth degree. In other words, you, you, when you have a knife, you actually would be able to cut anything with that knife. And uh, I can attest to that because I've got a scissor that you cut hair with and you can cut your finger off with it. That's how sharp it is. I mean, the steel is just amazing. So that kind of, um, there was also, of course, there's the spiritual side of all of this, um, which I might share with you. Um, the, um, as far as that is concerned, um, uh, the, the, United, uh, the United Kingdom, England, and, and so forth, and Holland actually also. They, um, they had what uh, I call the intellectual part. They, they knew very well how to do that, and that's how come uh, they, they could figure out how to handle all these people from India, okay, for so many years, because they were in a way smarter. And, and knew how to rule. And um, so that was that part. But in the middle of Europe, I mean, Germany and Prague, it's sort of really the heart of Europe, there, there was a birth of what I call the I am, the individuality, the, the focus on the individuality. And uh, that was something that is hard to control, as you know. Uh, those people that speak the truth, they have to have a lot of courage and so forth. So they they actually um, they didn't want to allow that. 
it was nice. And they also, when you looked at the weavery, weaveries that they had in the UK, they did not work as well as the weaveries in Germany. So the technology for all kinds of different things were at a higher level in Germany. And uh, those people in power didn't like that. And just as an aside, um, the funny thing is even now, we have the patent office for the United States is actually in the UK, which is amazing. So they have first dibs on what they want to allow and what they don't want to allow. So um, I think that's an important part um, that we should be aware of and how much technology was actually held back for the public that could have, we could have had energy already for a long time if we had, uh, you know, if we had power over our technology. And shared, by the way, and not somebody, I mean, we should uh, uh, support those people who invent something new. They should be supported, but there should really not be any kind of, um, that they get the money and royalties for ever and ever, uh, because, um, you know, when you hold a patent, you know, that's what happens. And really, where does the knowledge come from that um, is going to make you be able to invent something, you know? So uh, the whole question of money and how do we support each other and, um, you know, the story comes to me of the long spoons. I don't know if you've have seen that. Uh, meme on, on the internet, um, there's a whole circle of people, maybe 30 or 40 people, and in the middle of that circle there is a, a soup pot, a big pot of soup, and each one of them has a long spoon, a 10 foot kind of, how you know, spoon, and they can all, they can all reach the middle of the pot, but they cannot reach their own mouth. And a friend of mine said, Oh, that's no problem. I'll just go along the handle until I get to the spoon. And I said, wow. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of people who, who um, find ways of doing it. But of course, the whole idea about the long spoons is to feed each other, you know. I mean, if we learn how to do that, and to my way of thinking, that's really what we're all about. That's what we're supposed to try to do. Anyway, so getting back to the politics of the IM, um, then of course we had World War II. I was born in uh, World War II, right in the middle of Berlin, and uh, you know, spent my uh, babyhood being dragged to the bunker, and um, my mother stood outside because I was screaming so hard that they said, "Get out of here." And she stood outside with a with a, with an umbrella to ward off the shrapnel that was coming down. You know, when the bombs explode, all kinds of shrapnel comes. So, anyways, um, uh, so you know that lasted until 1945, and then of course those people who were really in charge with the propaganda and all that kind of thing. And this is really how my journey started. Uh, because I came across two books that a friend of mine recommended for me to read, and that's about 25 years ago or so. And um, so these two books really opened my eyes about that uh, we don't really have a government that has, has uh, the um, uh, well-being of uh, the people at heart. And they, that's just not how it is. In the meantime, we've had propaganda. Uh, the whole educational um, part was kind of attacked. Uh, there was a fellow in, in Germany by the name of Wundt, and he um, did behavioral science, that he is the father of that. And he said, you know, just put the kibble for the mouse or something, and the mouse will do what you what you want them to do, go along and so forth. And they, t they took that uh, model and put it into the United States. Um, I was saved from that kind of um, uh, indoctrination in a way, 
because um, after the war, when I went to school, uh, there was only um, very old pe people that weren't really even teachers to come and teach us, and very young ones, because the middle ones, they were all killed in the war. and, and uh, uh, so I, I was actually very fortunate that I wasn't indoctr indoctrinated, and um, um, which, for which I'm very gra grateful. But anyways, um, so this is World War II now coming to an end, and of course then the whole idea of how do you actually, um, how do you conquer a country? It's actually not by the war itself but by all the destruction. So you had all, I mean, um, Germany, of course, and, and England even, and uh, anybody who wanted to build something new had to borrow money from bankers. And then you have how many years to pay it back? I think um, uh, it, the, the, the reparations for, the, for the World War II were only finished uh, in 19 in the 1990s sometime so uh, and some of it even longer than that so um, I would say um, we have to kind of look to see what we do with money that is uh, I think um, you know the, the the because if you have a lot of money then you can buy some soldiers and do some things, you can buy the universities, you can buy the whole technology, all the medical research, you can buy all of that and here we are, you know, a century later uh, facing uh, another war, but this time not a war of um, with bombs, we don't need those anymore. We just need, we just have um, a war on our health, we have uh, a war on our freedom, we cannot talk to each other, and of course you all know that, this is nothing new that I have to tell you about that. Um, uh, now uh, to the, to the uh, current health crisis, I would just say a few facts that are just there. Uh, the fellow that um, started the PCR test, that actually invented it, uh, first of all, he said himself that it was never made to, to detect any infectious disease. And he said, and, and also very conveniently, he died um, in November of 1919 uh, under very, I mean, he was not old enough to die. Okay, and maybe we can talk about that later a little bit too. And um, so he, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing is with my research I found that they were already uh, sending the PCR test out to all countries in the world in 2017, 18 and 19. They even called it COVID-19 tests. And I have, in my computer, I have the, the uh, actual papers that prove it. So, in other words, um, you can see that, uh, you know, the research that has to be done with that has to go a lot deeper and it has to be um, communicated to a lot of people who are absolutely not aware of the whole thing. So, um, th those are just a couple of things about the COVID. And uh, the, the other thing is, I don't know if you've heard of Thomas Cowan, Dr. Thomas Cowan. Okay, some of you have and some of you haven't. Now his research and the, the research of Dr. Andrew Kaufman uh, in the US, they um, have, uh, of course, they know about, um, you know, the research that has been going on for many years and you know, the invention of viruses and of course they've also gone into the whole germ theory. So if you don't educate yourself about the germ theory, then you think that there's such a thing that, uh, you know, there are germs all over the place and they kill you all the time. So this is the lie that's been kind of upheld since Louis Pasteur and even he said on his deathbed that it's actually the terrain. In other words, if you're a healthy person, 
uh, there's no problem. I mean, all the nurses in the First World War or whatever, whenever they went and uh, went into hospitals or something like that, and the doctors, they never get sick of what they're treating in the patients. So, um, you know, you have an idea that um, uh, that is something that um, is on the, uh, that is the groundwork for all these vaccines. Now, uh, the way that um, Dr. Uh, Cowan uh, started is uh, he had, has a 10 minute video where he describes very simply that um, when you're poisoned by something, and of course we have enough poisons around ourselves for many years, and the way to handle that, um, you kind of uh, get a cold if you're healthy enough, and then, you know, um, the cells in the body, they um, butt off what's called exosomes, okay, pieces of RNA or whatever, something that is not alive, of course, viruses are not alive, people know that, and now they think all of a sudden they are. So I would, uh, <laughs> if, if, if you do a little bit of research about that, I think um, there's a lot on the internet, of course, and I have some books here that um, will um, uh, substantiate that. Now, uh, going back to pa the pandemic of 1918-19, um, that was actually the first time where we've actually had a new attack on humanity. Okay, so by that time, uh, electricity, of course, uh, Faraday, uh, I don't know if people know about Faraday, who started um, electricity, the, he, he was really into that. Uh, but uh, we've had electricity at that time. Um, my, uh, my stepfather actually had uh, a little steam engine, you know, it wasn't any bigger than this, and it, you know, so we could have, <laughs> You know, we, we got into something that we didn't know um, how it would affect us. Um, when the trains first came in the early 1900s, people said, well, people will go crazy because these trains are coming by all the time, okay? And they were right. I mean, something happens to us when, when we have technology like that, and of course, electricity and magnetism. You know, again, the polarity. So, um, you know, we, we kind of have to be aware of what happens there. So with the electricity, and all of a sudden we had electricity worldwide. And so we had that pandemic at that time worldwide. Because people, you know, some of them, if they had, uh, they had made also um, uh, um, experiments with people like the, the, the people that were expen experimenting with electricity in the 1800s, they actually let that, those currents go in through them and see how much can you take before you die, that kind of thing, you know? I mean, they, first they had little currents and they even thought that it would be, uh, could be used for health. And of course, when I was uh, in my childbearing years, I had a friend whose uh, sister actually got electric shock treatments because, you know, they thought there was something wrong with her and shock treatments would help. They electrify the whole body like you wouldn't believe. They don't, of course, they don't do that anymore. But at that time, it was really rampant, you know. So, you know, how much can a body take before they actually die? So we really have to pay attention to what electricity and magnetism do. You know, again, we have that polarity there. So, you know, we get, get a contraction with the magnetism and expansion with the electricity. So um, then, of course, when the radar came out, we had more um, effects on people getting sick at that time. And you can, when you, when you follow all the different um, inventions that they have, all the way up to, you know, G, uh, five, uh, 1G and 2G and 3, now we have 5G, that which is actually can be, um, if it is at 60 gigahertz, I, I think uh, that is the, the, that is already military grade uh, radiation. You know, you're putting your, you're putting your head actually into a microwave oven when you're using your cell phone. I mean, people really now have to really see 
what this new disease is all about because people did die because of overexposure from 5G in Wuhan. That is a known fact because some of them just fell over and, and you know, died. I mean, and of course they kept that all pretty secret because Wuhan is the first city where they had it and the, the whole city was covered with uh, 5G towers. So, um, you know, here we have a new disease, you know, that we have to deal with and we all innocently walk around with the cell phones and um, so I brought um, some books which I highly recommend for instance there's one by uh, a, nam uh, a man by the name of Furstenberg and I'll show it to you I think these are the three books that um, are absolutely for the future, um, the, the, it's so needed. This one here is called, and I'll hold it up, um, uh, Electronic Spring, okay? This is, um, uh, you know, not so technical that you can't, um, and I'll hold it up to the camera, I don't know how you can see it, okay? Um, the, uh, because we had a silent spring with the with the chemi chemicals with um, what's her name? Somebody knows the name. Um, Rachel Carson, right? Rachel Carson. So that was in the 50s. So we were being killed with all kinds of things besides the electricity. But anyways, this is a, a nice one for somebody who's never heard of anything about that kind of thing. So. That, that is helpful. But uh, here, this one here, uh, The Invisible Rainbow by um, Arthur Furstenberg. He is, um, he is an amazing guy and he has actually, in this book he uh, traces the whole of uh, development of electricity and how we have, to, because we all sleep in a bed and we have the outlet right there Okay, we have those effects all around us. We are surrounded by electricity all the time, you know. And then we go for a walk in the woods to feel better, and we take our cell phone along, and we have the connection to the to the um, what do you call it? satellites, right? So, um, <laughs> I I find out this time, for me, is the most important and the most. Um, uh, I would say positive uh, way to lead into the future. We've had a whole year that has been pretty rough, but um, but it <laughs> but it is <laughs> we're playing with the copper balls <laughs> or something. Anyways, uh, we've had a whole year of uh, we couldn't come close together, and we. Um, six feet apart was the whole idea, right? And are you all done over there? <laughs> okay. So we had a whole year of um, hard times. I mean, I haven't been able to go to the health food store to, to get my food because they won't let me in there without a mask. And I've been thrown out of three stores I'm very proud of that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, to round the whole thing up is the only way that we're going to be um, able to handle the situation, and not only handle the situation, the, the situation, but to go forward with a positive view of how we, because it's only us that can change the world. And I always say it is a good idea to kind of know that, um, you know, when somebody plays the piano for the first time, it doesn't sound very good. And there are people, many people, who are still at that stage of their knowledge about all these different things that are actually attacking us. 
and how the government is not the way that the government should be and uh, that the newspapers are not the way that they should be and the mainstream media is not the way they should be. So we kind of have to really make sure that we get that piano player to play the piano a lot more so they know more. And of course a concert pianist, well he plays the piano just perfectly. So somebody like Thomas Cowan, the doctor, and, and, and Dr. Uh, Andrew Kaufman, they are concert pianists compared to the people that don't know how to play piano, you know? And